Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service. I'm going to start us off with uh, a few announcements, and then we'll proceed to the uh, uh, to the um, um, opening. Uh, so a uh, few things. First, uh, welcome, welcome uh, on Zoom or Facebook if you're if you're online with us. If you're here, um, thank you for enjoying this beautiful hot day with us. We'll actually be doing refreshments on the lawn outside. That was really nice last week. We're going to do it again. Um, so please uh, make a few minutes after the service to join us for drinks uh, just on the sidewalk outside the building here. Um, I'll also just recap how you can get general information in case you, you haven't been with us long enough to have heard this seven or eight times like most of you have. Um, you may be used to a paper bulletin. We stopped doing that at the beginning of the COVID um, lockdown um, and we've continued electronically. So the best way to know all the things that are going on at the church um, is to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, easiest way to get, a, to, do, to get that is to go on our website um, or reach uh, the church office by email. And uh, the best way to get the church email is the website. So I'm going to keep pushing you there. So a christianbaptist.ca or Google Christian Baptist Church Newmarket. If you Google Christian Baptist Church Newmarket and our church doesn't come up, let me know, because that means we're not doing our job with keywords and things. Um, but anyway, christianbaptist.ca, super easy. Um, and you'll have a link to, uh, to sign up for the newsletter, contact information for the office to get more information on anything. Um, uh, you'll also see how to donate there. Uh, we prefer electronic uh, donations or, or a check at the church office. We won't be passing an offering plate, although if you do have something, you can drop it up here. Um, some of the things we started doing in, in, in the pandemic have, have worked out really well for us. It's, it's really efficient and, and easy and less work on volunteers to do offering online. Um, uh, I, will, I will highlight one thing from the newsletter this week, which is a call out that the next community meal is uh, August 13th. So that would be a Saturday at noon. Um, so we've started, we, we did one in, in uh, June. Um, we used to do a community meal every two or three months to serve the community, folks around us, um, and, uh, and that worked well. Um, but then we started opening it up and we've invited all of our congregations, uh, this congregation, the Chinese congregation that meets before us, the uh, Wednesday um, uh, Persian congregation, the Thursday uh, New Flame, and we'd love everybody, to, everybody who's in town that weekend to join us uh, at noon um, outside on August 13th. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Andrew and he may call on some other folks just to talk about the, the weekly meal that we do uh, from our building here. Oh, George, you gotta come. Come here, come here, come here. <laughs> so I'm bringing George up here because I'm gonna, I'm gonna let George just speak for 30 seconds about how great uh, Wednesday was. As you know, Wednesday we do, uh, we were doing in the Annex Cafe a breakfast to serve the needs of the community. We were getting on a slow day, two or three people and on a big day, 10 to 12 people. But we made a decision, uh, George, George um, Flack, uh, George Meisner and myself to try to move towards a lunchtime meal because it seems to meet the needs in the community um, a little bit better. George, what happened? Well, I have, I have the opportunity to go to other meals. So I was saying it to other folks because they didn't know that it's on Wednesday lunch, because it's the app, it's the cafe annex early. So we had about six that I know of for sure from the other meals that showed up. And I said, let, let the word out. We had, oh, 15, 20, easy, absolutely easy. And it was awesome. There were actually 45. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> 45. <laughs> but it, you know, the people were so appreciative. And we had the opportunity, George and I, I and Andrew as well, we had the opportunity to share the love of Jesus just by a hot dog and a hamburger and a cold drink. And that's what it is. It's sharing God however you can. It doesn't have to be rocket science. It can be over a hot dog. 
It can be over a coffee. And just, if you feel that somebody needs an encouragement, even here, give them a call. What, what do you, what, you know how much you will gain by it? Loads, absolutely loads, guys. So that's, and if you know of somebody that needs it, we're going to do it for the month, I understand. Yes. <laughs> so George isn't at all excited about it. So I'm trying to encourage him a little bit uh, in this. But yeah, we had, we had probably 45 people served well over 60 hot dogs and hamburgers uh, to people in need and a whole bunch of people that we've never met before. Um, I think it tells us that we're doing something right. We're doing it in the right direction. So I posted this on Facebook. I posted a couple of needs that we might have for this. And an interesting comment came back. Two people said, it's really nice that you're doing this to help people in the community, but why do you have to do this under the banner of a church? Why do you have to go and, and tell people that you're a religious organization? You're just trying to proselytize them and, and, and trying to make them all Christians. And I said, and we are a church, and you're right, and we don't make mistakes on that. I said, I'm also a driveway sealer, and my faith translates into when I seal driveways, and I share the love of God with people when I, when I do that. So when I feed people out here and obey the command of God to give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, I do that unapologetically, and I do that with the love of Christ. So if you are interested it is Wednesdays. Um, we asked for a fridge for the annex um, because we think that we need a larger fridge. I posted it online and within three minutes, I had a lady say, I've got this great big old fridge in my house and it's not old. And we'll be picking it up this week to be able to put it in uh, the annex cafe. Um, we had several people in the community say, what, you need three picnic tables? Listen, I don't have any money right now. Stuff is really tight for me. But if you get the wood, I'll be there to build it. Um, so people in the community, and they are not ashamed of being associated with the church to make that happen, which I think is really awesome. So that's my announcement about the Annex Cafe. Um, you are welcome to participate in any way. Donations are accepted towards that, uh, your love. But most of all, pray for those of us who will be there, right, Tammy? So that we would have the right words. Tammy was with us as well. Um, so that we would have the right words to be able to make people feel welcome, uh, to encourage them, and to share with them the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jeff, come on, join us. Well, good morning, everyone. Everybody here, we're filling up. I see more people today than I have uh, for many weeks. And hi to everybody on Zoom as well. We're here on Sunday worship service at Christian Baptist Church in sunny downtown Newmarket. We gather here each week to worship the one true, thrice holy God, and to worship and learn from his word and have fellowship with one another. Worship is not for our entertainment, but rather for our sincere expression of awe, wonder, joy, and thanksgiving to God and his mighty works of creation and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read some Psalms here, excerpts taken from Psalm 10, 97, and 145. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the son of men and his eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous and he loves justice and upright men will see his face. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. 
His lightning lights up the world and the earth sees and trembles. The mountains mount or melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame and those who boast in idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. O Lord, for you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth and you are exalted above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil for he guards the lives of the faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous and joy upon the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous and praise his holy name. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all that he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all that he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and he saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. And how can we as sinful humans approach such a righteous God? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful summer day and the multitude of blessings that you rain down on us each and every day. We ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us in worship this morning and that he would open our ears and hearts to your eternal word that brings life and hope and salvation. We pray that you will guide and bless your servant, Pastor Andrew, so that he may proclaim your word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations and forever. Amen. Let us all rise and sing our first hymn. This morning we're doing three hymns.
song and crown him Lord of all We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all The big question these days for me is, do I have the right glasses? <laughs> so I have reading glasses, I have driving glasses, and the reading ones are red, so we're good. But I was saying to Ron on the way here, you're going to have to read because I can't find my reading glasses. But here we are. So praise the Lord, we've got the right glasses. Um, Romans 6, we're reading today, um, verses 1 to uh, 14, and we're going to read from the New International Version. That's Romans 6, verses 1 to 14. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in his death. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know, we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness for sin shall not be your masters because you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Amen. Today, I lift my eyes to the heavens and count my blessings. I think of all my needs were met today. The clothes on my back. A place to lie down tonight. Nothing miraculous or earth shattering. Just the small things that help keep me going day after day. Thank you, God. I have food on my table. Help to get me through the day. Good memories I've shared. All the beauty that makes life special. Thank you, God. I'm blessed by what I can see and touch. What I can feel in the moment. But Lord, you transcend feelings and moments. You sacrificed your life so that I could see beyond what's under my feet and over my head. <sighs> Thank you, God. That kind of love keeps my heart free. During seasons where peace is hard to come by. Even when I can't see or touch a blessing, I know I can close my eyes and say, thank you, God. I've, I've lost a lot this year. Things I worked hard for. Dreams I was sure were gonna come true. People I never wanted to say goodbye to. I walked a hard path of trial. And pain and despair. But I never walked it alone. Even now, I can say thank you, God, because no matter what is set before me, dark valleys or green pastures, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And when this life is over, I'll dwell with you in your house forever. So I just want to stop 
and tell you. Thank you, God. 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 You've given us so much, and so often we stop and forget to say thank you. You've given us life. You've given us liberty in Christ. You've given us freedom. You've given us your righteousness for our unrighteousness. And what we give back in our tithes and our offerings are just a picture, a shadow of the gratitude that we have in our hearts. Receive these gifts, Lord, and use us in this community to be able to do exactly what Jesus told us to do in Matthew 25. To give a cup of cold water. To visit those who are alone. To clothe those who are naked. To comfort those who are in trouble and in struggle. Because as much as we do that for them, we've done it for you. So Lord, use our gifts, use our tithes, use our offerings for the furtherance of your kingdom. And so that we might see one more, know and experience a living and life-changing relationship with you, O oh God. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Well, welcome to week three of our five-week study. Yesterday, or last Sunday, we took a break in that study to focus our attention on communion, uh, specifically. But today, we're going to continue in Romans. And so far, we've talked about sin. We've talked about Jesus and the power of the gospel. As you know, God has saved us from sin and death through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But God didn't save you only from sin, only to have you wait patiently like the Thessalonians thought they should do until the end of their life when they got raptured up and live into heaven. No, you've been saved from sin to live a life of hope here and now, here on this earth. A life of freedom in the pursuit of what the Bible calls righteousness. We have freedom to walk away from our old lives of sin. Freedom to walk away and to choose a new way to live. Freedom to not live like the world lives, but to live as Christ has called us his. We are free to live in righteousness and to live as a holy people. So grab your Bibles, turn back to Romans chapter 6. That's what we're going to be focusing primarily on today. And I want to read again just the first 11 verses. I want you to grab hold of that. Judy, thank you so much. I love when you read. You have such passion in your voice for the Word of God. Let's read it again. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Catch the emphasis of what Paul says here next. He says, by no means. He's essentially saying to us, are you nuts? Like, seriously, you think that you can continue to sin so that God can be more gracious towards you? Are you crazy? Sorry, let's go on. That, that's the Andrew unauthorized version. Verse 2, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. If we have been united with him, like in this in his death, we certainly also will be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Verse 8. Now, if we've died with Christ, 
we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died for sin for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves as dead to sin, but alive in Jesus. This passage has a ton to unpack, and I'm going to attempt to do my best job at it this morning for you, but it's not going to be exhaustive. And I challenge you, go into the Word, look more into it, because it's got so much for us. So this morning, I want to focus on the picture that Paul is painting for us. And that picture is about how we relate to Jesus. And I want to offer some biblical direction when it comes to living a righteous life. The Bible makes it clear that God loved us enough to send his son Jesus to die on a cross, suffering what he did for us. He experienced the same temptations that you and I do. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, in every way that you and I are tempted, he too was tempted. When I was a young person, I had a hard time struggling with that. Because when I was tempted to do things in, in, in my 20th century world, you see, the world outside, they didn't experience the, the world back 2,000 years ago. They didn't have the temptations that I had. And I thought, no, Jesus couldn't have been tempted. But, but the scriptures say in every way he was tempted. And yet he did it without sinning. And ultimately, he even gave himself for my sin. And because of his sacrifice, Paul says that that is what unites us with Christ. What he did on our behalf that we could not do on our own. We've studied that over the last few weeks as in the earlier part of Romans. But what does it mean for us to be united with Christ in his death? Look at verse 2. It says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? Paul is making a point here that when we have repented, literally, when we have turned our lives to God from evil, from our sin, from our old way of life, that we have turned our backs on that old way of life. And we have turned our backs on sin. We have turned our backs on death. Now, obviously, a life of sin isn't exactly a fulfilling way to live, is it? No, it might be fun for a little while, or we might think that the joys or the pleasures of it are good, but it's not. But many of us have spent most of our lives, years even, associated with things and practices and, and, and thoughts that we kind of even believed were okay, but they had nothing to do with living a righteous life. I have a friend who used to go to a strip bar. It was for business meetings only. In fact, it really was. He wrote more business at the bar than he did almost anywhere else. It was a social thing, and he only did it once a month. Thursday nights, in fact. In fact, it became so much of a business thing to him that he looked forward to every Thursday night. Sometimes those Thursday nights led to um, new acquaintances that could potentially spawn new business associations. And sometimes it was just purely social and fun. But he justified the social and the fun because, after all, it was providing for his family. The problem was he didn't realize the effect that it was having on his wife and kids until he came home one night and he found that they had left the home and never returned. Without even noticing what he was doing and even justifying that which he knew what he was doing, he was walking into darkness. It didn't look like darkness. It looked like friendship with other people. It didn't look like association. It looked like getting connected and getting ahead in the world. It didn't look like trouble. 
But in the end, it led to disaster for his family. And for those of you here in this room today who have turned to God from your idols, as Paul said in Thessalonians, he said, for they themselves bear witness to how you have turned to God from your idols. Do you ever wonder why it is that Paul said it in that order? Why don't I turn away from my sin and then turn to God? Anyone have an idea? It's because our sin feeds our hunger for the sinful nature. And if it's feeding us, we don't want to turn away from it. And I want to be real honest and real straight and real up front here. If we're feeding our sinful nature, it's awfully hard for us to look at what is true glory and hope and life. So Paul puts a prescription for us that is key for us to understand. We do not turn away from our sin and turn to God. We turn to God so that he can turn us away from our sin. We need to focus our attention towards turning to God first. Paul says, shall we continue in our old ways so that life uh, of life so that God's grace may increase in our life? By no means, Paul says. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is what? Fun? Well, but, but sin is fun. It gets my way. But no, he addresses the root of the issue, the truth of the issue. For the wages of sin is death. And that brings further clarity to the point that Paul's making for us today. We cannot live in both worlds. We cannot have a Christian life neatly organized and, and, and polite on Sundays and probably on, on our small groups if we're involved in that or, or by volunteering at the Annex Cafe or in, or in one other means like that. We can't compartmentalize God into a piece of our life. And then have our business dealings, our personal dealings, our, our, our personal life kept somewhere over there, protected and safe. And ever the twain shall meet, as the expression goes. But a life apart from God is no life at all. In fact, the only payment, the only acceptable payment for our sin the only thing that can wash us from the old life of death is trust in Jesus. Listen, you could work 70 to 100 years and the only wage that you're going to receive from sin is death. But the good news is, that's where Jesus steps in, right? Because of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, the curse of the old life, the curse of sin has been kind of taken away. Oh no, folks, listen, I'm going to get excited here, okay? So beware, I, it may not be very Baptist, but it's very me right now. I want to tell you something. It's been broken. The old way has been broken. You have power to live with Christ. Broken sin's power. Is that not great news to us? We don't have to trip anymore. We don't have to fall anymore. We don't have to be caught up in our sin nature anymore. We can be made new. And when we do fall, when we do fall down and scrape our knees again and get bloody noses again, God's grace is so amazing that he lifts us back up. The scriptures say that he lifts us up out of the miry foot the miry pit, and he places us on the solid ground, and he establishes our way, and he gives us a way to walk. Yea, God, we're not left alone. Because of Jesus' death, the curse is broken. Because he was raised to life for our justification. Again, just as Paul says, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, I too 
may live in new life. Yea, God. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Pastor Andrews had too many energy drinks this morning. Look, if this is confusing to you, I get it. I understand. You certainly wouldn't be alone. But here's the key. I think that the Holy Spirit wants you and I to grab hold of today. And you can say, well, this is a great message for, for my parents. This is a great message for my kids. This is a great message for that person over there. And you could probably point the finger at who this message is really great for. But here's the key I think the Holy Spirit wants for you and me to understand. Because we have been united with Christ by faith, we're dead to sin. We're not just sick. Okay, it's not just a cold. It's not just a prolonged COVID-19 type of death. We're talking dead, 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 dead to sin. And it means it's no longer our slave. And we're no longer slaves to it. Do you not see how great that is? It means sin doesn't call you back. It doesn't define you. What defines you is Jesus now. And because we're no longer slaves to sin, we know that we are free. Free to live our lives abundantly as Jesus told us to do in John 10.10. 10. So yes, we're united with Christ in his death because we die to our sin, but we are made alive to Jesus in a newness of life that brings freedom and hope to every aspect of our lives. The Bible says our old sinful selves were crucified with Jesus on the cross, and therefore our old way of living is meant to stay on the cross. In fact, that's what the nails were there for. The problem is often we run back, don't we? We run back and take ourselves off the cross. We convince ourselves that we can have abundant life without this part of Jesus. In fact, we, we actually think that we can have abundant life with Jesus and with this little pet sin. We think that somehow we can include, we can have Jesus plus. We can have our old man and our sinful habits and patterns so long as we clean ourselves up for Sunday. It's like a farmer who goes out to sow wild oats on Saturday night and comes into church on Sunday morning and prays for a crop failure. It doesn't work. King Solomon was very wise when he told us in Proverbs 26, verse 11, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats their folly. But God wants to show us the best way to live. The most excellent way. In fact, Paul says in another passage of Scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Well, what is it? Doing a whole bunch of good things? Saying a whole bunch of good words? Preaching a real good storm on Sunday morning? No, he says, in fact, that, that if I do that, if, if all I am is lip service, I'm a rusty old gate squeaking. And in fact, in the Andrew Hamilton translation, once again, I'm fingernails on a chalkboard if I don't have love. God wants to show us the best way to live, and he gave Jesus as the example of that, to be our role model. We can live a righteous life by leaning on the example of Jesus for us today. He was, he is, and he will be the perfect picture of righteousness for us to lean into. Now, how many here are perfect? I guess my glasses are bad because I couldn't see anyone there. Maybe it's on Zoom. Is anyone on Zoom perfect? See, God shows us how to live, but ultimately it comes down to a day-by-day -day choice, doesn't it? Will I continue to pursue the things of this world? 
Will I choose to pursue holiness with God? Will I go back to my old life or will I embrace this new life that I've been given in Jesus? Matthew 6, verse 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you as well. Jesus invites us. It's an invitation for us to seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. Why? Because he knows when we do that, we will find the very best that this life could offer in him. We find freedom and hope and life. But there's a question that still remains. Even if we make the decision to chase after the things of God, what does righteous living even look like? Like seriously, is it some boring old, I've got to go to 12 services a week? I got to put up with those people who sit on that side of the church every Sunday again and again and again. Do I have to keep going back to Pastor Andrew and listen to him? I guess that's why people church hop, right? Well, Paul makes it very clear that a good starting place is dealing with our old self. We start there and we remember where we have come from. We remember that, but we make a choice to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're no longer the person of the past. If we've chosen to be living with Christ, if we've said, if we've, if we've made a declaration of faith in following him, the old us is meant to be gone. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul again says, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a rental person, right? If anyone is a, a new person in Christ, he has this really great new suit that he can put on and everybody else can be confused, right? No, he actually says we're a new creation. A new creation. Well, why is it that I keep battling the things of the past? Because those things need to be put to death. Listen, older person who's here today, this doesn't just affect those who are younger. This affects you too. The old is gone. We can be new in Christ. Paul calls us a new creation. And yes, we may be tempted to go back. Living a righteous life is not always easy. I had someone ask me a couple of weeks ago, but I still deal with this temptation. It just keeps coming into my life and into my life. And I don't know how to cope with it. I don't know how to deal with it. I, I, things I've seen in the past, they keep coming back to my eyes. The things that I remember from the past, they keep coming back to me. How do I deal with it? How do I deal with it? Martin Luther addressed this issue really good. He said, a bird flies over your head. He said, you have a choice to let it nest in your hair. You get what he meant there? Just because a temptation flies over top of your head does not mean you've sinned. But when you let that thought, when you let that sin come into your head and to build a nest and to start making a home in there, that's where we fall into sin, isn't it? So just because the temptation comes over your head, don't beat yourself up on it. In fact, rejoice. Rejoice that you are found worthy to be able to see that temptation and say, you know what? I'm not going there anymore. I don't need to be part of it because I'm made new in Christ Jesus. And as we move forward, the key principle for us to hold on to is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. As we walk with God, God's Holy Spirit provides us with direction, provides us with hope, provides us with comfort, encouragement, each step of the way, if we let him. And he produces something in us. Galatians 5, to 25 says, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, for those who belong to Christ Jesus, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And as we walk with the Holy Spirit in our lives, the Holy Spirit is given to us when we give our faith to Jesus. It's a promise given to us. There will be fruit demonstrated. If we're looking for a list of things that God cares about, listen, Galatians chapter 5 is a great thing. It's a place to start. These are the unforced rhythms that God produces in our lives and the lives of those who have been redeemed. And the good news is, we don't have to achieve them on our own. They're gifts from God. We're set free to live a righteous life, but we aren't expected to do the new life alone. God knew we couldn't do it alone. That's why he sent a helper. I, I, I wish George... Meisner was here today because I would ask this question of him, but have any of you ever gone through a move? Have you ever had to move? Have you ever had to do it on your own? Have you ever had to do that move, you lifting, you packing, you putting stuff away, you lifting it up, putting it on the truck, you taking it out and getting it to, have you ever had to do it all by yourself? It's brutal. But likewise, we don't have to do anything in the Christian life by ourselves. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to us. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, verse 7. He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. I'm sure the disciples didn't think that it was to their advantage. But he said, for if I do not go away, I cannot send the helper to you. But if I go away, I will surely send him to you. Jesus said it was to our advantage. <laughs> when we have to move from the life of sin and move into a life of holiness, the burden's too big. It's too big to do on your own. We need each other. And we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come if you believe. And it's a pretty amazing thing for us who belong to Christ. The Helper is our advocate. He is the Holy Spirit. They're all in the same. That's not a new person, a new God. He is the third person of the Trinity. And Holy Spirit's job is to empower, to engage, to enable, to guide each of us along this journey of faith. Let me say this again. It is his job to empower us. It is his job to enable us. It is his job to convict us of sin. It is his job. And he is there for our entire faith journey. You don't have to be alone. The pursuit of righteousness is not only a, a shared journey, something that we do in community. It's an empowered journey. God knew that we needed an extra help for the road. And he sent that divine help. What an amazing gift. Moving is a difficult task. And it's infinitely harder if we do it on our own. And maybe some of us here have been Christians for a long time. And you've stayed much the same. God doesn't want you to stay where you are. He wants to move you. Matthew. You're going to have to say that again. Oh, we're getting there, pal. You are absolutely right. You see, this is, the, this is the key. When you move, you don't pick up all the old garbage, do you? And keep it with you. I mean, what good would it be 
Bruce, you just moved from the old house. You had to get rid of a whole bunch of garbage, right? And you couldn't do it alone, right? Friends, when we come to Christ, there are things you got to leave behind. I can't even imagine how hard it would be if we had to move in this journey towards Christ all on our own. But Christ paid our price. And the Holy Spirit is our mover. Pursuit of righteousness is not a sprint. Yes, it's true. Some people come to faith and miraculous things happen in their lives. Many of the rest of us struggle for a long time. Our old ways have deep roots. One of the things that I love to, I know you'll think this is crazy, but my son is a lumberjack. I call him a lumberjack. He doesn't like that term. He prefers arborist. I am a lumberjack. Sorry. I hope he didn't see this today. <laughs> but there are times that you need to prune a tree. And there are times you need to cut the thing down from the root. And sin needs to be cut at the root. And the Holy Spirit is our great arborist. He can do that when we feel like we can't anymore. The Holy Spirit is our guide and He is our power. Pressing into the Spirit begins with prayer. It begins with personal prayer. I'm not very good at that, Pastor. I, I really get praying and I fall asleep. Or I just don't have the words and I don't know what it is. I know what I want to say in my heart, but the words just don't come out. It starts with prayer. And when we do not know what to say, the Scripture says Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will give us the words, the exact words, just at the right time. So share your concerns, your questions. Share everything with Jesus in prayer through intentional focused time of prayer. Spend time with Him in silence. Practice being silent. Practice listening. I know it's brutal to do in this day. But the question is this, what is it that you're hearing? What are you listening to? Where are you feeling the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit speaking into your life, even today? Talk with others that you can trust in the Lord. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Bring your questions to those who've walked the journey longer than you and be encouraged. God has saved you from death. He's given you life through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. But God didn't save you from sin only to have you wait patiently for His eventual return. No, He saved you to give you freedom. You don't have to walk the path alone. You are not alone. What hope we have in Jesus. What assurance we have in Jesus. What newness of life we have in Jesus. One of my favorite songs when I was a child, when I had first come to believe in Jesus, had a chorus and it said, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Blessed assurance. That's what we have with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in closing today, this is what I want to do. This is hymn number three. I'm going to ask that you would stand up. And Jeff, you can start the song. He's going to put this song on. And we're going to sing together. Blessed assurance, a song of testimony and a song of hope.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. I can be forgiven. I am forgiven in Christ. In fact, it is the life I now live. I now live in the spirit and not in the flesh. And I do not need to live in that anymore. The temptation that comes into my life, thank God I have this Holy Spirit that can keep me from falling. And so it is to you, O oh God, that can present us faultless, that can keep us from falling that can keep us from stumbling. If only we would keep our eyes on Him who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. And He suffered its shame and its scorn when I deserved the shame and the scorn. And He was raised to new life so that I too may be raised, oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. So we look to that day. We look to that day when we will see him and we will be like him. The temptation of the past, gone. The fear of being alone, gone. The struggle that we dealt with as we tripped and banged our foot and, and scraped our knees and and crushed even our own heads. In Christ, we are free. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for being able to live a righteous life in Christ. Give us power through your spirit to live until you bring us back again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now listen, church, before you run away and get out of here and escape, I will remind you again, we don't come here to do church. We come in here to learn from the Word of God. 
We come in here to be instructed by the word of God so that we can go out there and be the church because the world needs the church. We don't need more church. We need more Jesus. So I encourage you, when you go out here today, the people that may come up to us on the sidewalks, any of the people that may come up to us on the sidewalks, they need Jesus. Will you be Jesus for them today? God bless you, church.